You say Marco. I say Polo. You say Marco. I say Polo. Welcome back, guys. Ben Simpson here at Simpson Vlogs, and this is another explained video. Make sure to sit back, relax, go drink, kick your feet up. Most importantly, have fun. Chat links down below. We've got my website, we've got Simpson Plays, and of course, we've got TikTok, Instagram, Rizzle, and Twitter. And this is explained Marco Polo fact or fiction. You know, like, comment, subscribe, your thoughts at the start, and then like, comment, subscribe, your thoughts at the end. Marco Polo, perhaps the most important explorer or tale of explorer, whether you want to believe he went on his travels or not, to have ever existed. Without this man, without his story, we wouldn't know half as much as we did about China. We wouldn't be half as much interested about Asia. And it inspired an age of discovery from which we have only seen now we're trying to explore the depths of the ocean and space. His adventure with his father and uncle changed the world. I am here to tell you just how much he did that. The man was born in 1254. A boy who was more or less abandoned by his father, kind if you want to look at it that way, when his father and uncle left to go on an expedition of trade. And trade in those days was done like it had like it was going to be done. For the next 200 years and past 5,000 years beforehand. He got a horse or a camel, he got a, maybe if you look, he had a boat and you went along the trade routes and you went to people trying to sell your wares or you know swap them, you know, actual trade this for that. Oh, but you know, by then it was more commerce trading, you know, we give you this, you give me money, I use this money to buy this and then do that to flip another profit. You know, business, early entrepreneuring. And unfortunately, Marco's mother died and he was, you know, loose, raised by loose, loosely related relatives until his father returns. So they arrive back almost, well, 10 plus years later. He's around the age of 15. And by the time he's 17, they set off again. And this is where the story of stories takes place. You wouldn't, he could, he, I don't even think he would have imagined that when he left Venice, his home city, at the age of 17, would he imagine he would embark on a journey that would change the globe. Before, you know, his, his, his father and uncle had had met the great Khan, Khan of Khans himself, Kublai Khan, the last of the great Khans. You know, grandson of Genghis Khan, emperor of the largest land empire to have ever graced the planet at the time. The largest empire to have ever graced the planet. It spanned almost all of Asia, the Mongol Empire. They had met the great Khan and the Khan had allowed them to meet him and had sent them back in hopes of diplomatic ties to Europe. Kublai Khan was a man who was very interested in the wider world, you know, beyond Mongolia, beyond China, beyond, you know, his rural background, beyond Asia, to see what knowledge he could gather. And they were able, his uncle and father were able to establish diplomatic relationships between the Khan and the Pope and they were meant to, you know, bring Christianity to Asia and bring, you know, money, you know, China ware, silk and all, all those stuff they could only get in the Far East back to Europe and in return pass some stuff from Europe to Asia, to the, to the great Khan himself. They came back, they, you know, they said, the Pope said yes and he gathered his son and they all went. And just to put in context of how hard this journey ended up being is that 
They were meant to get a boat in Israel and sail around to China, you know, to the cities of the Great Khan in Zhandao. And instead, they end up trekking from Persia. Or, or you know, they end up going to Israel to, to, to get some, you know, diplomatic papers, some, you know, pick up their caravans kind of thing, you know, their wares and stuff they're going to bring back. And the holy water that they were, that was one of the most important items they were meant to bring back. And they brought two priests. The two priests quit the journey before they even got to Persia. And then when they got to Persia, they decided there wasn't a good enough boat to get them round those treacherous waters. You know, you know you're talking about sailing all the way around India and stuff. And, and, like, that's a long way to sail. Anything could happen. Monsoons, shipwreck. And they end up travelling through the deserts, over mountains, into canyons, fighting bandits. And a four-year trek, four years of walking. Some of us don't even walk four days. <laughs> And they walk four years to meet the Great Khan. And we did it. You know, we got there. And not only did they meet the Great Khan, they were given seats at court for their journey. Courts of the Emperor. Now, granted, Kublai Khan was a man who, who recognised foreign talent. There was many foreigners. You know, when I say foreigners, many you know, non-Mongol um, or, or Mongol descent, non-Mongol people on his court. There were many advisors to him that were foreign from places he'd conquered or from further away, like, like Europeans. And whilst many didn't accept him, he did. And it was because he did that they were able to serve at court for a whopping 17 years. Marco Polo came there a young man and left a middle-aged man of extraordinary wealth in both wares and knowledge it's in according to marco polo himself i mean much of what we know about marco polo comes from marco polo i'll explain that later but that's why some people you know dabble whether it was fact or fiction but at this point and what it and what his story ends up inspiring it doesn't matter. Anyway, back to the story. He is given, you know, a seat at court. He ends up becoming a tax collector, a financial advisor, governor, more or less, financial governor of the Mongol Empire. Not just of China, the Mongol Empire, an entire empire. He's given such a huge responsibility of collecting money. You know, you need money. And... In doing so, he learned so many things. New ways to bank. I mean, Europe still traded in gold, copper, and silver. You know, you know, that's, you know coins like that. In in Asia, in the Mongol Empire was able to be so big and administer itself so well because it switched to modern day currency, money, paper money. Granted, it wasn't paper we know today, or even paper itself. It was wooden bark stamped with the seal of the Khan. But it was money, which allowed the Khan to keep all wealth to himself. You know, stuff like gold and, and jewels and rubies, stuff that the money was measured against was all his. And everyone else had the paper money, like the governments of today. You know, the government has the gold bars in the bank. We have paper money or, you know, digital digitalized currency you know but the governments are the ones that are the, are the kings and queens or you know lit back a bit further back but nowadays governments are the ones who own the gold that was all because of Kublai Khan or the Khan the Mongol Empire in general and the way it advanced into Europe was because of Marco Polo and he was able to see the entire Mongol Empire because he was given a seal of the Khan, a great honour that allowed him to pass freely through everywhere and see so much. I apologise for that cough. Like, comment, subscribe down below. Hit the bell notification if you want to keep up to date with more explained videos. But that is his adventure. Now, with the Khan being older than Marco Polo, they knew that there was great animosity, especially from the Mongol tribes, against them as Europeans. They're not even Asian. And against their customs of Christianity. 
or as you know, they were Catholic, so I say. So they actually begged to leave. Now the Khan didn't grant them their wish for quite some time. Obviously, like I said, they ended up serving seventeen years. And it was around twelve ninety two when they were finally allowed to, to leave with the final mission of accompanying the, uh, the Mongol princess um, to the court of the Persian leader of the Mongol Empire. So the way the Mongol Empire was mainly administered, it was obviously Kublai Khan was emperor. But he kind of, you know, he took it as, you know, every country needed a governorship. So he, he decided that his seat of power would be in China. You know, that's where he decided it would be. So the Mon Mongolia had a governor, Persia had a governor, you know, all these other places, all these con other countries had governors of their own that answered to Kublai Khan. Obviously, after his death, they will all become warring states and, well, you know, China being the most powerful of <laughs> land power and everything else and being where the seat was, ended up becoming the dominant one in the region and the Mongol Empire fell apart. And that is what they feared the most. What would happen to them should that come to pass? So they decided to leave and they escorted the princess. Funny thing though is that the Persian Mongol, when they got to the Persia, the Mongol leader had died and the poor princess had to end up marrying his son, which was a lot younger than she was. But from there they sailed away and you know they explored more of Asia and eventually they returned back to Venice in 1295. Another three years later, not four years, but they did take boat, but they did, you know, they stopped off in India, they stopped off in all these different places, and eventually they come back to Venice. And here is where the changing point happens, because despite all his travels, all the wonders he's seen, you know, he's probably seen the Great Wall of China. He has seen so many things, so many breathtaking sights, so many natural and scientific wonders. He was never going to document this unless Venice had was at war and Venice was at war it was at war with Genosa another um, you know what do you call it like kind of like the Greek city-states Italy was at the time you know you know city-states of you know it wasn't really in Italy it was a city-states and they were they were at war Venice versus um, Genoa and it was customary for everyone to contribute and they contributed a lot of their wealth that they brought back to build a fleet and, and, and fund parts of the Venetian army. And Marco Polo ends up getting captured and imprisoned. And it was during his imprisoning that he met another he met a famous author named Rusticello. I think I'm pronouncing that as best as I can. This author was famous in Italy, in the Italian region, so I say, for producing the works of the King of Arthur in Italian. And Marco Polo and he, you know, he documented a 200 page manuscript of Marco Polo's adventures, which would become known then as the travels of the world, but to us now as the travels of Marco Polo. And it was because of that famous meeting, that, that coincidence of them being at war, leading to his imprisonment, that we have the most epic travel tale of the time and probably still to this day. It inspired so many things. I mean, we, for the first time, it was the first time ever Japan had ever been documented to Europe. We didn't know, we knew China existed because people had been before. You know, Marco Polo's father, Marco Polo's uncle and others had been to China and back to Europe. But never had anyone been to Japan or even talked of Japan. First, we we finally heard of this mystical place called Japan, and it inspired travelers like Christopher Columbus to try and sail from Europe that way around, from you know, from Spain towards the Americas, which he didn't know existed yet, to try and get to Japan. And that's what ends up you know how it, how we end up discovering the Americas, you know, South and North America leading to the United States and other countries being formed. Without Marco Polo, we wouldn't have money yet, as we know it, perhaps. You know, it might have happened much later. You know, stuff like Chinaware and gunpowder and all, all these different ways and things of doing things were inspired by his travels. 
Now there are discrepancies in the tale and they may have been down to you know his state of mind after being imprisoned or you know maybe embellishments in all of his tales. I mean if I travelled to a place that no one ever been to I'd exaggerate too. But we know so much was right just because of other other texts that correspond to what he's saying. And whilst he wasn't men mentioned in Asian texts, which is another reason why some are skeptical about whether he went or not, and he doesn't mention wonders like the Great Wall of China, or atrocity, or certain atrocities, or things we would frown upon nowadays, especially like the binding of feet to make feet smaller in a, in certain cultures over in Asia. Um, but what can't be denied is some of the stuff he says was definitely true and what it inspired is more important than the legitimacy of the tale. So you can take from that as you will, whether it's fact or fiction. There is enough evidence to keep it as fact. There is not enough counter evidence to keep it as, as fiction. Like there is no, you know, there's no other mentioned names in, in, in space of him. And we know from Venetian documents of his birth, he existed, we know his family existed. We know he lived and died a wealthy man and much of his wealth was because he had you know help from his ways in china to fund rebuilding his family business and expanding it in in venice and in fact when he died he was famous at the time and, and mourned by the city as, a, as an important member of the venetian community and whilst many pleaded with him to to, to tell the truth on his deathbed he stuck to his story and in fact said if only you knew half of what I had seen. We know this man was extraordinary. He was His charisma bought him a seat at the court of Kublai Khan. His adventures inspired a generation of explorers and an era of discovery. And his tales have inspired chants and stories and even a netflix adaptation which i am so upset they did not continue because it was getting really good it may not have been accurate but it was getting really good and if i had money like big money obviously i would pay to have that finished netflix if you're watching this video somehow please bring back marco polo that was a good series i was emotionally invested in that god damn them <laughs> But yes, in my opinion, it's fact. And even if it's not, I'm going to believe it is, is because it inspired so much and changed the entire globe as we know it. It was responsible for European expansion, which whilst it was atrocious in many aspects, is also the reason I'm here speaking English. <laughs> I'm able to make great videos for you guys and perhaps the reason you guys are alive so with that, you can comment down below your own thoughts and decide for yourselves whether Marco Polo's adventures are fact or fiction. But until you do, I'm going to love you and leave you. Like, comment, subscribe down below. Hit the bell notification to keep everything on this channel. If you want to check out Simpsons Plays, that is linked down in the description along with my website. I don't have a link if you can, but you're not able to. And of course, TikTok, Instagram, Rizzo, and Twitter for your lovely faces to enjoy. I hope you enjoyed this video, but of course, if you didn't, run it back and try again. I'm going to love you and leave you. Peace.